kids, welcome back to Sunday School and lesson number six of the life of Joseph, doo -doo, son, slave, sovereign, and savior. And you can say it with me. If I let him, God will help me to become the best me I can be. Let's invite the Lord to be with us too. I'm so glad each one of you are here with us in our Sunday school class, but let's invite the Lord Jesus to be with us too, shall we? Let's join hands, close our eyes. We love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us. We invite you to be with us, Lord, and help us to be more like you. Help us to be more like Joseph. If we're more like Joseph, we'll be more like you. Help us to listen and hear with our ears, listen with our mind, and obey with our heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we learned a little bit more about Joseph, didn't we? How he got out of prison. We're going to be hearing about that in a second, I'm doing a little review. We also learned about initiative and what that looks like, problem solving, and how Joseph used initiative in front of Pharaoh. We also encouraged you to fill out your four pillar challenge. You guys are doing great building your pillars all summer long, doing all kinds of great things to build your mind, your body, your soul, and your heart. Good job, all of you. Eliza um, and Chloe, you handed in pages this week. Excellent, we're so proud of you. Good job. We all like things to kind of stay the same, don't we? We don't like a lot of change. And this summer, this year has been a year of changes. Things are so different. And things that we no normally do during the summer, we're not able to do quite the same this year. And it makes us a little bit uneasy. It's sort of like makes me think of a baby. You know, a baby before they're born, they're in this little small, snug, warm, place, quiet, dark, and they would probably like to just stay there. But then it comes time for the baby to be born. And when they're born, they come out of and into this place that's not so snug and not so dark and not so warm. And, and it, there's bright lights all around. And the, and the doctor maybe gives them a little smack to get them to cry a little and, and to breathe a little bit. And oh, it's a big change. Well, you'd cry too if you went through such a big change. It's sort of like Joseph. Joseph also went from the prison to the palace in literally one day. Everything changed. His, his responsibilities changed. He, where he lived, he went from a dark, damp prison cell to the palace. His clothes changed. Everything changed literally overnight. Except that for Joseph, he went from something not so nice to something really good. So let's have a little review. Remember last week, Joseph was in prison and the butler finally remembered him. You know, I was wondering, do you think that God could have given the butler a thought about Joseph before he did? During that two years, do you think that he, the Lord could have given butler, uh, the butler a thought about Joseph and helped him remember him? He could have. But God was waiting for something, wasn't he? He was waiting for some, this special night when God was going to do something special. Do you remember what that was? He was waiting to give Pharaoh two dreams, right? Right. He gave Pharaoh two dreams. Two dreams about Wisconsin. <laughs> Pharaoh had a crazy dream one night, and he dreamed about seven fat cows and seven skinny cows and seven fat ears of corn and seven skinny ears of corn and the, the skinny cows ate up the fat cows and the skinny corn ate up the skinny corn, the fat corn and pff, it was a crazy dream. What does it all mean? Well, suddenly then they remembered that Joseph could interpret dreams and they went and got him out of prison and they brought him before Pharaoh. And sure enough, Joseph was able to tell what the dreams meant. What did they mean? Seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. They were like the fat and the skinny. And there was gonna be seven years of plenty and followed by seven years of famine. And everybody was gonna be hungry. But Joseph also used initiative and came up with a solution for Pharaoh that he should find a wise and discerning man that would oversee the whole country of Egypt and decide where the food was gonna go, the extra food, and store it and keep it safe so that there would be plenty to eat, plenty of food to eat. And sure enough, 
Who did Pharaoh pick to do that job? None other than Joseph himself, the one who had just been in prison, who was standing there. And Joseph went from living in a dark cell to living in the palace. He went from walking barefoot to having beautiful royal robes. He went from, from literally being in a prison cell to riding around in a beautiful chariot. He went from being all alone to having a beautiful wife that Pharaoh gave him as enough. And he went from being called Joseph to the new name that Pharaoh gave him, Zaphnath Paania. Remember? Can you say that? Zaphnath Paania. Wow! In one day, literally, everything changed for Joseph, literally overnight when he went from the prison to the palace. Now, the Bible says that when Joseph was standing before Pharaoh, he was 30 years old. 30 years old. Now, how old was he when Joseph was sold by his brothers and put in a pit and sold as a slave? How old was he then? Do you remember? He was 17. So, how many years has it been? If you subtract 7, if you say, take 30 minus 17, 13 years. 13 years as a slave, 13 years in Potiphar's house and he became Potiphar's overseer and then he got thrown in prison and he was there for a while. All of that took 13 whole years. So now he's 30 years old. God was with Joseph that whole time. Not only was God with Joseph, but he gave Joseph the meaning of Pharaoh's dreams, didn't he? And not only did he give the meaning of Pharaoh's dreams, but he gave Joseph the solution to what the dreams meant and what to do. And not only that, God gave Joseph the wisdom, the discernment to actually follow through on what God had predicted through Pharaoh's dreams. He gave him the wisdom to know what to do and to follow through. And sure enough, for the next seven years in Egypt, the fat cow years and the fat corn years, there was plenty of corn, plenty of food produced. The rains came, the food grew, the corn grew, the wheat grew. There was plenty of food for everybody. And they stored it in the cities and they stored it in the field. And there was so much corn, the Bible says, that it was like sand on the seashore. There was just so much food. During those years, let me hear you say, meanwhile, meanwhile, Joseph was the prime minister. He was the second in command, wasn't he? Only to Pharaoh, second only to Pharaoh. He kept track of all of that food. He kept track of all of that. He kept good records and he kept track of where all that food was stored and made sure that it was stored carefully so that they could keep it for the famine years. Yeah, those five bags of corn over there, I want you to stick it in that storehouse right there. And uh, Oh, you got 10 bags of corn? Yeah, put it in the warehouse at the end of the row there. And oh, 20 bags of corn? Yeah, let's see, put part of them over there. And he kept track of all of that corn. In fact, the Bible says after a while, there was so much corn that Joseph couldn't even write it all down. There was plenty of food. History also tells us that Joseph may have dug channels from the Nile River and channels for the water to flow, canals in a way, waterways, for the water to flow out of the Nile into the fields to irrigate the fields. They, part of those channels are still there today and they call them the waterways of Joseph. Joseph did a great job. When he was prime minister, he did a great job. Do you think that he had to learn some new skills? Yeah, I think so. Do you, he had to learn to read and write Egyptian hieroglyphics. They wrote in pictures. They didn't speak that language back in Canaan. They didn't speak Hebrew. He had to learn to read and write Egyptian. He had to learn to do math. He had to learn engineering. He had to learn how to keep good records. He had to learn how to manage thousands and thousands of workers in Egypt, keeping them all working and how to make sure that nobody stole from the warehouses and the storehouses. Wow, what a big job. 
Not only was the land of Egypt fruitful, but God made Joseph fruitful too. During those seven years of plenty, Pharaoh had given Joseph a beautiful wife, remember? Her name was Azinath. Do you think Azinath called him Zaphnath Pania? Zaph, maybe? Or maybe Mr. Z? <laughs> well, the Lord gave Joseph and Mrs. Z two sons during those seven years of plenty. Two sons. The first son was named Manasseh. And Manasseh, his name meant, God has allowed me to forget the pain of my past. So Manasseh was first, and then God gave them a second son, Ephraim. And Ephraim was named Ephraim because his name meant, God has made me fruitful. So the two boys, their names meant, God has made me forget, and God has made me fruitful. So those two boys were born to Joseph during the years of plenty. Joseph had seven happy years of plenty. But then, let me hear you say, but then, but then, sure enough came the seven years of famine. When no rain came, no crops grew, no, there was no food being produced anymore. And for the first time, they started to wonder where they were gonna get enough to eat. Now, at first, Egypt had plenty to eat. They had plenty of food in Egypt, why? In the beginning of the famine, because Joseph had done a great job. He had done a great job. The famine wasn't just in Egypt, the famine was over the whole world or wherever there were people in the world at that time, the famine was everywhere, it was a worldwide famine. But because of Joseph, Egypt had food and nowhere else did they have food. But then the Egyptians ran out of the food that they had and they got hungry and they started running to Pharaoh and they said, Pharaoh, we're starving in this famine. It got worse and worse and worse. We're starving, we're hungry, we want bread. And they would go to Pharaoh and Pharaoh would say, don't come to me, go to Joseph, ask him what to do. Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Joseph was in charge. Joseph started selling the food that he had stored away to the Egyptians. And then he started selling the food to the people of the other countries that came to Joseph to buy food. So Joseph was not only the ruler in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh, he was like the ruler of the whole world because Egypt was the only place they had food. And all of the people in the other countries started coming to Egypt to him. Let me hear you say, wow, wow, the ruler of the whole world. Egypt was the most powerful country on earth at that time, and Joseph was in charge of all the food. Well, meanwhile, let me hear you say meanwhile, meanwhile, up in Canaan land, we haven't talked about what was going on up there. Up in Canaan, there was Jacob, and Joseph's 11 brothers. They're still there. And the famine was bad there too. And one day J Jacob looked at his boys, his 11 sons. He said, what are you looking at? We're starving up here. We need food. We need food for your kids and for your flocks and for your goats and for your wives. We need food for all of it. And we're running out of food. So." We need you to go and get some corn, and I know where you can get some. I heard that there is corn in Egypt. I want you to, I want all you guys to pack up and go to Egypt and buy corn. You, get going. Reuben and Levi and Simeon and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun and Ben, no wait, not Benjamin. I don't want you to take Benjamin. Leave Benjamin with me. I can't lose Benjamin. Something might happen. Don't take Benjamin. So all the brothers packed up their donkeys and their camels and they got their empty sacks and they traveled down, all but Benjamin, traveled down to Egypt to buy food. Now when they got there, 
they discovered that they couldn't just go to the grocery store. They couldn't go to a farm stand. They couldn't just go buy corn just anywhere. They couldn't go to Corn Mart. They had to go and see the governor of the land, the prime minister himself. They said, we got to go see this uh, Zafnath Payania guy. And he's the guy that we've got to see to sell him, to have him sell us some corn. Oh man, what if he won't sell to us Hebrews? We're shepherds. Egyptians don't like shepherds. What if he doesn't? Oh, let's not do it. No, we have to. We have to because we're starving and father's up in Canaan land starving. We have to go. Come on, let's just do it. So the 10 brothers came into the court of Zaphnath Paeania. And when they all approached where he stood, they all bowed down, all of them, before the prime minister, Zaphnath Paeania. Now who was Zaphnath Paeania? It was Joseph, right? The governor was Joseph. His 10 brothers were bowing down to him. Now, does that make you remember something? Kids, does that make you remember a dream that Joseph had so many years before? When he dreamed that all of the brothers were all out binding sheaves in the field, and his dream said that all of their sheaves would bow down to his and they made fun of him for that dream, remember? Well, sure enough, it was happening right before his eyes. Joseph knew who they were. He saw them and he recognized them. But guess what? They didn't recognize him. They didn't know it was Joseph. Here they were, bowing down to the little brother that they had sold as a slave, that they had thrown into a pit. The brother that, that all those years ago they had Sold, sold as a slave, and they didn't even know it was him. Oh boy, this is getting delicious. What's gonna happen next? Are their brothers gonna know? Are they gonna recognize him? We'll have to wait until next week to find out. This is such an exciting story. So let's just have a little review. How old was Joseph when he stood before Pharaoh? 30 years old. What happened during the seven years of plenty in Egypt? Joseph kept track and made sure that they all had, all the food was stored. Stored safely to be eaten later, right. What were Joseph's two sons' names? This is a, was something else that happened during the years of plenty. He had two sons and they were named Manasseh and Ephraim. Very good. What happened after the seven years of plenty? Then came the seven years of famine. Was the famine just in Egypt? No, it was all over the known world at that time. And who came down to Egypt to buy food from Canaan? Joseph's 10 brothers. You know, there's power. We're gonna talk about the power of doing what is right. What is this? Can you see this? What is this? This is a house key. This might be my house key. This might be your house key. Have you ever been given a key to your house? What kind of responsibilities would come with being given the key? Wow, there's a lot of freedom to having a house key. But there's also something else. There's also responsibility. When you leave the house with your house key, what do you do? You lock the door and you take your key, right? Should you give your key to a friend? Let me hear you say, no, no, you are responsible for it. Is it okay to forget your key somewhere? No, no, you are responsible for it. Is it okay with just to play with your key and, and just leave it anywhere? No, you are responsible for it. Your families Safety and possessions depend on you being responsible for your key. You are responsible for it. With a key, you can get into your house when your parents aren't home or nobody else is home to let you in. 
with a key that you can keep other people from coming into your house. You can lock the doors. With a key, you can protect your home from burglars and invaders by being responsible with your key. But are you going to just stand out on the porch and say, hey, I've got a key to my house. It's right here, folks. This is the key to my house. No, you're going to keep it hidden. You're going to, because you're responsible for it, you're going to keep it hidden in a safe place, aren't you? There's power in keeping doing what you know to do is right. Like Joseph, all those years, Joseph kept on doing what is right. He knew what he was responsible to do. He knew the truth about the one true God. It was like a key to God's presence, and he obeyed the one true God when nobody else cared or even was looking, when he was all by himself. Somehow, there was a little voice in him saying, Joseph, you are responsible for this key. It's the truth of God. You are responsible to keep it. Now remember, Joseph, all those years, he did not have the Bible. Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Bible, he wasn't even born yet. Joseph did not have a church. He did not have a synagogue. He did not have family. He did not have friends to support him. He did not have the Holy Ghost. He did not have the blood of Jesus to cover his sins or stories about Jesus to encourage him. He did not have the internet. He did not have Sunday school or Christian music. None of that. Joseph had none of that. All he had was a key. He had a key that was the truth about the one true God. Stories that he had heard from his father, that's all he had. Stories about the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because J Joseph stayed true to his responsibility, to his integrity, he stayed faithful to God because he did. God set him free to save his whole family from starvation and literally save all the Jewish people. Wow, the power of responsibility. This week's character trait is orderliness. Can you say that? Orderliness. Now, orderliness for some of you comes easy. And for some of you, it's going to be a little bit more of a challenge, a little tougher. Think about it. Look outside around you. The sun sets and rises every day right on schedule at the expected time. The sun can only get so hot. The ocean can only come so far. Trees and flowers and the wild animals, they all live by a set routine. Whose routine? God's routine, set by God. There is order all around us. God does everything in order and keeps everything in order. God is in control. So orderliness is godliness, isn't it? What is it? Making sure that everything has a place and everything is in its place. It's caring for things, your things and the things of others and keeping track of things, just like Joseph kept track. He exhibited orderliness. When he served as governor or prime minister, Joseph had a lot of responsibility. He had to take care of so many things. Joseph had to keep order. Orderliness is also making sure that our time is used wisely and we choose our priorities wisely. Getting done what is the most important things first. Now, once Joseph got his new job as prime minister, he could have just sat around and just bossed everybody and, and treated them all like slaves like he had been and forgot what he was really supposed to do. But he didn't do that. He clearly showed orderliness. So what does orderliness look like for you and me? Making sure that you keep the first things first. First things first. Remember? Number one, number one, I want the Lord to be number one. Putting first the God stuff. Prayer and reading your Bible and praise. Doing first things first, like 
the things that your mom and dad expect you to do. That's the most important thing after the God stuff. Eating first the healthy foods before dessert. Thinking first before you speak or act. Or it is doing the right things the right way at the right time. Order, say that with me. Orderliness is doing the right things the right way at the right time. That's what orderliness is. How can I develop orderliness? Well, you can say, this is one way, you can say with me, I will pick up after myself. Say that, pick up after myself. I will put things away the right and complete way. You can say, I will have one toy out at a time. One toy out at a time. You can say, I will look to see what else I can pick up. You can be picking up things and then you can look and see what else. That's all ex uh, examples of orderliness. So how can you work that into your four pillar challenge? You know, you're working on building your mind, your body, your soul, and your heart or your relationships, you can put in some orderliness into that this week. And don't forget, some of you might not know, that if you work in the character trait, you put a little star by that brick and you get extra points, an extra point for every star, up to five. So you can get up to 15 points for this whole page if you work in a little of the character trait. So this week it should be easy. There's lots of ways that you can show orderliness in what you're already doing. So like for your mind, how can you show orderliness? Well, you can even just think about the most important things to do first and then do those things. You could do a dot to dot picture, you know, doing the lines in order. You could read a book about orderliness, and there's all kinds of books. I know the Berenstain Bears have The Messy Room. There's another book called Prickles Versus the Dust Bunnies, and there's other books about orderliness if you look at your library or see what they have to offer. How can you build st your strength pillar with orderliness? Well, one thing you can do is you could play a game while you're putting your toys away, you could set a timer and see if you can beat your last time and see if you can pick up your toys faster than you did the last time. You can eat your veggies first. That would be one way. You can um, go around your house with a bag and collect all the socks or all the toys or all the books and put them away. You can organize a bookshelf. You can organize your closet. Those are all ways that you can be physical and show orderliness. What's a way that you can build your soul with orderliness. You could make a routine to pray and read your Bible first before doing anything else. You could also be consistent in working on your memory verses. That takes orderliness to make a plan to do that. You could do that. How could you build your heart or your relationships? Well, that's easy. You can help your mom or your dad by helping put away the dishes after a meal or or seeing how many days you can keep your room straight that will make your mom happy or you could see how quickly you can get your shoes matched up side by side and keep them that way for a whole day or a whole week or you could how about this you could get ready for church early and be be ready a few minutes early before it's time to leave that would show orderliness and that would count on your sheet all good ways. We're getting a, we're doing a new memory verse this week. We are at the end of our alphabet. Z is the last letter of the alphabet. We're learning the Z verse today. It's a short one. Be zealous therefore and repent. That one of the shortest verses we have. Let's say it again. Be zealous therefore and repent. It's from the last book of the Bible, Revelation 3:19. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Revelation 3.19. These are some of the last words that Jesus is recorded as saying. And Jesus says, in, along with this verse, he says, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. And if you will let me come in, I will be with you. 
The, um, then he also says, the people that I love, the people that Jesus loves, he says, I rebuke and I chasten. In other words, if I love you, I'm going to try to correct you. So therefore, be zealous and repent of what you do wrong. Be zealous, be energetic, and be quick to what? Repent. To say you're sorry for all the wrong things that you've done in your life. Revelation 3.19. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. What an exciting lesson. It's going to be exciting to see what Joseph, if, he if his brothers recognize him, will they? We'll have to see. But join me again for the next lesson. But in the meantime, let's pray. And I'm going to pray a blessing over each one of you. Jesus, we love you so much and we thank you, Lord. We want you, to, Lord, to help us to, to know that our lives are a way that we can show order in our lives, that we can worship you in, in order, and that we can be like you, Lord. Help us, Jesus. We see that how Joseph was careful in his life. We want to be careful, Lord. We want to keep things neat and orderly and keep track of things just like he did. Help us, Lord Jesus. We want to be like you. Lord, help us, Jesus, to do all that we can to be the best us we can be. We, Lord, we pray right now for Chloe and Asher and Eliza. We pray for Farah and Alex. We pray for Michelle and Phoebe and Destiny. Pray for Ellie and Anton and Calla. We pray for Braylon and Brielle, Taylin, Kylie and Shay, Ezra and Phoebe and Lily. We pray for Isaac and Joanna and Noah and Naomi. We pray for Jack and Renly, Lord. Bless Eliza, Adele, and Finn, Matthias, Azariah, Arabella, Jedediah, and Aveline. We pray a blessing over Noah and Benjamin, Chris and Jacob. We pray a blessing over Sister Galki, Sister Angie, who had a birthday this week. Happy birthday, Sister Angie, and Sister Brandy. We pray a blessing, Lord, over our pastor. Bless him, Lord Jesus, and help us, oh God, to be more like you this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you this week. Have a great week. Be orderly, and we'll see you next time. God bless you. Bye-bye.